What would your life be like without her? In an upside down, like crazy, crazy world, you know? Alternate universe. She left you or something. I'd have nothing. Nathan and I, we started out more as friends, you know, and admirers of each other's work more than anything. And we didn't really set upon making anything together. It was just mutual sensibilities. And I guess it's weird to talk about, but it really was just that I was like, oh, I like that guy and he does good stuff and I want to be his friend. And so every time I was in L.A., I'd reach out to him. He came to New York and that's where we met the first time. And it was just we saw that we had a, a mutual kind of obsession with realism and how do you get at that. And with his shows, he's coming at it from a nonfiction place and I'm coming at it from a fiction place. And we kind of meet right in the middle in a kind of a great way. I have this innate desire to kind of enter reality with fake things to try and create some sort of a ripple of something, you know. And with that character in particular, it was more just like, oh, I want to see if I can get away with people thinking I'm a real guy. And I think that a lot of his show is a lot of that. I remember watching Nathan For You linearly on television, you know, and, and I, even before I knew him, I took a picture of one of the ads on the subway and it was like, how is this guy annoyed by the same things I'm annoyed at? In my head, it made sense, you know? And when I saw like specific episodes of what he was doing, performance, all this stuff, it just, again, it wasn't about wanting to work together. It was just about wanting to just kind of rap about stuff together, you know? I guess we had always talked about being in it, you know? I was like, I could be the producer. You can be the, the husband. Emma came along because Nathan really, he's like, she's so funny and she has all of this talent that's like bubbling at the surface, which is obvious. But this is such a hard role. And he was like, I really think she can do it. And I'm like, there's no question, but like, how can we get her on board? And he's like, I think she'd want to do it. And then we talked with her and we told her all about it. We read all the scripts together. We talked about the character and different backstory and motivation and everything. And she just locked in. And with Dougie, it was the kind of thing where we kept bringing him in because it was almost like a math problem. You know, you could have Asher and Whitney in this situation, but then once you had a Dougie in, it was like a chemical reaction or a math thing, A plus B equals C but then B plus C equals what? It's not A, is it? So that's kind of how we treated Dougie and used him in a lot of ways is to kind of highlight certain parts of different people's personality. When, what is it like when he's with Asher? What is it like when he's with Whitney? How does that change each person? And also just what he looks like is you're so easily identifiable. People think they know exactly who that guy is and then it's on us to try and create an underside, an inside to him. And that was fun because you're taking such an extreme example and trying to make him so human. Barkat is one of the greatest actors ever. You know, he has this insane ability to just make anything seem real. He just has such a weight to everything he says and it's always so natural. And originally he wasn't going to be a father with two kids, you know. It was going to be maybe a mom or a grandmother. We weren't sure, but I was just like, ah. Oh. I really wish that we could just make him younger and have it be Barkod, because that would make things a lot easier. And then we're like, oh, it's a fiction show. We can do whatever we want. You know, so we, we made it Barkod. And then we had to find the, the daughter. And then that meant we had to go into the community in Minneapolis, because Barkod is Somalian. It's a heavy Somalian population. We needed his children to reflect that. We had um, Jen and Debbie Delisi. They went into kind of that area, and we found these two girls were so good and again we'd only counted on casting one but when we saw both of them it just became a totally new thing that we could kind of work with and that was really the whole process it was really alive the whole time every time we cast somebody we changed it for them every time we met somebody we talked to them get their ideas and it just was folded right back into the show i had seen this amazing old candid camera clip of it was black and white shot on film and it was in a van and it was a mechanic across the street and they were filming and the mechanic was over there doing his thing and he was the mark and as the but then the person who was part of it just kind of walked all the way over here and the mechanic followed them but the camera was stuck here and all they did was they just turned on the car and drove 
repositioned and then they just stopped and then they continued their frame and I was just like that motion and that kind of reference to somebody was just awesome and I'm like we can use this for something you know this is really special and how can we take it to another place you know and shoot it on HD get high ISO noise and and really kind of play with the texture of what is real you know it was actually John Medeski is the composer. You know, Dan produced the score, but John Medeski is the one at the keyboards improvising. And the edict to him was, what you're doing is not going to connect to what you see on the screen. You know, you're going to be making emotions and then we're going to then take that and place it almost asynchronously to what's happening on the screen. And I think it was just because there's something about the music and Alice Coltrane was always there from the beginning. I had loved this kind of tracks from her ashram and it was really a long conversation with her estate to get them on board and really kind of come behind the project because the, what, there's something about the way she's singing and the music that just feels like somebody with knowledge of something that's much grander than what I know. And it's not judgmental but it's just existing on a higher plane. And the music had to kind of reach that too because here you have all these people doing things to people, to themselves, making judgments, doing all of these things. And the music exists on another level that's kind of almost like a closed captioning in a way of what's happening. It was really amazing to kind of see John who's this unbelievable improvisationist and jazz also. And he really just kind of took on all this knowledge of all these different organs and keyboards and there's pianos with stuff like shoved into it and it really was special because we could be like okay we have enough of this emotion how about something that's happy but not too happy and then I get a folder you know Nathan and I get a folder of positive ruminations and it's just a hundred songs in there and we really were just like we had this whole library of stuff that we could just kind of piece and move around and kind of find places for it we only very rarely scored to picture. We would mostly cut our scenes, use the music and be like, this is what's missing. And then we would talk to him and he would just come up with music, you know, to these ideas that we would tell him. So it was pretty amazing.